Today is Monday, December 11th, 2023, and my guest is journalist and author Mati Friedman. This is Mati's second appearance here on Econ Talk. He was last year in June of 2022 talking about his wonderful book, Who by Fire? In that book, he tells the story of Leonard Cohen's trip to Israel during the Yom Kippur War of 1973, where Cohen played numerous concerts for soldiers at the front and in the process revitalized his career. Mati, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, before we start, I want to mention to listeners, I'm working to get some Palestinian voices on Econ Talk, but it hasn't been easy. I've written so far three people. Uh, none of them even responded. There could be a lot of reasons for that. Uh, I'm going to keep trying. I want you to know that I want to hear those voices and we'll continue to try to get them to the program. Our topic for today with you, Mati, is the media coverage of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the war in Gaza. And the reason you're invited is that uh, for listeners, Monty worked in the Jerusalem Bureau of the Associated Press between 2006 and 2011. And in 2014, uh, he wrote a piece about that experience. 2014, almost 10 years ago. I encourage you to read it. Uh, we'll link to it. My suspicion is that not much has changed in how the mainstream media, Associated Press, Reuters, The New York Times, the BBC, how they cover the Arab-Israeli conflict, in particular, how they cover the current war with Hamas. And I've invited Mani back to the program to talk about this issue, but I'm sure we'll get into other issues as well. Now, let's start with how many reporters, as you did in your piece in 2014, are assigned to the, say, Jerusalem Bureau or the Arab-Israeli conflict or Hamas or Gaza or the West Bank uh, relative to other parts of the world. I guess I should say at the outset that my experiences at the AP come from my time uh, on the desk in the Jerusalem Bureau, which is between 2006 and the very end of 2011. Um, I'm not in the Bureau right now, so I don't have access to the current numbers. But um, I'm speaking broadly from my, from my experience in those years and based in a general sense on those two essays that I wrote in the summer of 2014, one for Tablet and one for The Atlantic. When I was at the AP, we had about 40 full-time staffers covering Israel and the Palestinian territories. So we're talking about Israel, a country of about 9 million people today. In the West Bank and Gaza, 4 million, 5 million, depends on which numbers you believe. So we're talking about a story that incorporates about 14 million people. And just to give listeners a point of comparison, the number of staff we had here, which was 40, at some, and sometimes it was a bit more, um, that number was dramatically higher than the number of staff we had at that time covering India, which is a country of 1.3 billion people. It was more staff than we had in those years covering China. It was more staff than we had in those years covering all of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's 50-something countries. There were, there were more staff, more news staffers here in Israel than in all of those countries combined. And I think that that quantifies something that most listeners will probably get anyway, which is that you hear a lot about Israel. And Israel is a story that gets a tremendous amount of news coverage, even when very little is going on. In many years over the past decade, for example, the death toll in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was lower than the homicide, the homicide rate in Indianapolis. But the, the story is covered often as if it were the most important story in the world. And that was certainly true when I was at the AP. The Jerusalem Bureau was the AP's biggest international bureau. And the AP is or says it is the largest news organization in the world that claim is also made by reuters apparently so uh <laughs> you know we'll take it with a grain of salt but um these are the big news organizations that are doing the heavy lifting of, of news coverage and and by and large this story has been considered if not the most important story in the world and certainly one of them and of course today uh it seems to be the most important story on Twitter and probably in many, many other media outlets, uh, although that may be due to my selective uh, choice of who to follow on Twitter. Um, but it's clearly the case that the world's eyes are on uh, Israel and in particular on its behavior in Gaza. And I want you to start, let's talk about, uh, I, I think, let's talk about the nature of media. I, I think a lot of people, I certainly did until I thought about it more as an economist. When I thought about a major newspaper like the New York Times, or say when I lived in St. Louis, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, I imagined that the reporters get together in the morning with the editors and they have a meeting and they say, uh, 
what happened yesterday? And they say, well, this, this, and this, and they write it up, and that's the paper. But, of course, that's naive beyond words. The nature of a news organization is they decide what the news is to some extent, and there's some group think, so they tend to follow each other. Uh, are those is that accurate, my cynical view of, of the news business in your experience? I'm glad you mentioned Twitter because I think it, it, um, it's important to remember that a discussion of mainstream news outlets or you know the mainstream media, if that term still applies, it always makes me feel like Rush Limbaugh when I say mainstream media. But I think we know what we're talking about. We're talking about the big players in the traditional news industry, the New York Times, the BBC, AP, CNN, places like that. You know, in 2023, this discussion can sound a bit archaic because so many of those news outlets have been just gutted and so much discourse now takes place you know, on social media. So we're talking about you know, the, the big news organizations, which are, I think, still the places people go when they want to get an accurate picture of what's going on. But many people, certainly young people, are nowhere near those organizations anymore. But yes, the the description that you gave is, is accurate. I mean, I think often people imagine that news is kind of like an algorithm. So you have events on planet Earth that are run through a computer. And then what you get, you know, coming out on the other end is is news coverage. And I think even journalists like to pretend that our profession is a kind of science, you know, so you have biology, chemistry, journalism, physics, you know, those are the hard science hard sciences. But what we're doing is a very human action of taking these very complicated events on planet Earth and deciding how to describe them and deciding which events are important and which events are not important. There are many, many events on planet Earth, most events on planet Earth, which will never be in a Western newspaper. They'll never be of any interest to Western reporters. So certain things are of interest to the Western mind and many things are not. And there are many, many examples. And I gave some of them in those in those articles, just comparing the death toll in, you know, for example, the, the murders of women in Pakistan versus the number of people killed in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and why certain things are interesting and certain things are not. And often reporters, I think, are not honest about, on, not honest with themselves about why certain things are interesting and certain things are are not interesting. And um, I think that the Israel story and the just completely disproportionate amount of attention that is paid to it is a good opportunity to think about how the Western consciousness is skewed in many ways or imperfect and certainly not scientific. So when that news meeting happens, as you describe it in St. Louis or Chicago or, or New York, what comes to the table are a series of particular interests or a series of preconceived notions, uh, an idea of what in the world is interesting and what isn't. And, and what you get at the end of that process is something called news, but I think it would be a mistake to read that as a realistic portrayal of events on planet Earth. Now, when you were covering Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Arab, or just Israel issues or Palestinian issues, uh, you argue in your piece, again, written in 2014, that there was a particular narrative uh, that uh, was on the table at the Associated Press. Israel had a role to play in that narrative, and the Palestinians had a role to play in that narrative. Uh, what was that narrative? Uh, what was the uh, story that underlay or overlay, maybe is a better phrase, the, um, the coverage that was chosen? First of all, the story is presented as an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And you know, when I was at the AP, every day we had to write a story which was called in the internal parlance of the Bureau, is pals, Israelis and Palestinians. It was a story framed as a conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, when in fact most of Israel's wars have not been fought against Palestinians. Israel has fought wars, unfortunately, against Jordanians and Syrians and Iraqis and Lebanese, and Israel's most important enemy for the past few decades has been Iran, and the Iranians are not Palestinian. So clearly there is a broader conflict going on here that isn't an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But a news story needs to be simple. A news story functions along the lines of of a fairy tale. You need a princess and a dragon to make a really good news story. That's what will engage 
a reader who's not really going to be able to deal with complicated stories that involve, you know, many dozens of actors. So a good example of a story that's been a blockbuster news story over the past year is the Russia-Ukraine story. Why does that story work? Of course, there are many conflicts going on in the world all the time, but the Russia-Ukraine story works in part because the combatants look like people in the West. That's, I think, one of the hidden drivers of Western interest. And it also works because it's a Princess Dragon story. You have plucky underdogs, the Ukrainians, fighting Darth Vader, basically, in the form of Vladimir Putin. So that's a that's a story that, that works. So a story about complicated factors in the Middle East and Iranians and Syrians and Jordanians and, you know, 100 years of very complicated history, that's not really going to be able to grab a reader. So you simplify it as an Israeli-Palestinian story. And that's the story that people know, even though if you try to interpret events here using that format, they won't make sense. If you try to understand what's going on here as an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it doesn't really add up. You need to understand it regionally. But that's the framing. Within that framing, the story is about powerful Israelis and um, um, innocent Palestinians or certainly powerless Palestinians. And the story is set up basically as a parable about power where the Israelis are made to embody all of the ills of the West as liberal people see them. And I would certainly place myself in the liberal camp, by the way, just for anyone trying to guess. Uh, colonialism, militarism, racism, nationalism, all of these ills are embodied by Israel. And the Palestinians exist in a story largely as a foil. So you're not going to read a whole lot about the internal drivers of Palestinian politics. And when I was at the AP, we hardly paid any attention to the Palestinians as agents of their own fate or as actors in the story. They exist to be victims of the party that matters, which is Israel. And in, 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 in the stories I wrote in 2014, I actually started counting when I realized the problem at the bureau. I started counting the number of critical stories we were writing about Israeli society. And I can't remember now what the number was, but it was a very high number of just this kind of routine of kind of um, very aggressive criticism of all kinds of aspects of Israeli society. And the comparison to the number of critical stories we've written about the Palestinians was was absurd. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think we wrote more critical stories in a one month period about Israel than we had about the Palestinians in the preceding three or four years. So the party that's of interest here is Israel, and you can really see it in the current war as well. The the coverage is of Israeli actions. There was a coverage, of course, of the initial Hamas attack that started the war. That has now worn off, and now the war is basically portrayed as being a war with one side. It's just Israel. So if there's going to be a ceasefire, Israel needs to be, you know, forced to accept a ceasefire. And the the description of the campaign in Gaza is described as Israeli actions, and the Palestinians mm -hmm. are almost absent as actors in in the story. And I think that's very much part of the way the story has been set up, and it's part of the reason that it is very hard to understand actual events if you're trying to do so with the news story. So you come to this story in 2014 or to the present with your own set, of course, of biases, perspectives, frameworks. Um, an AP editor criticized your piece. You responded. We'll put links up to that also. Uh, but on the surface, it seems a little hard to believe. Um, uh, listener, Longtime listeners will recognize uh, Arnold Kling's Three Languages of Politics in in that book, uh, which I strongly recommend, it's a great book, he says, the difference between liberals, well, I'm going to call them progressives, progressives, conservatives, and libertarians, is they use a different lens. So progressives see the world through the lens of the oppressor versus the oppressed. And you've just described that quite well. The oppressor is powerful. The oppressed is not only oppressed, but is totally powerless, has no agency and no real responsibility uh, taken for their situation. The conservative sees the world as a fight between civilization and barbarism. Uh, the bar there's nothing redeeming about the, the barbarians. They have no uh, argument on their side, and it's – says the conservative, it's up to the civilized to defend themselves. And the libertarian perspective, which doesn't apply so well here, but just for – to finish it up the uh, – taxonomy, the libertarian perspective is to see the world through the lens of coercion versus voluntary, the power of the state versus freedom for the individual. And if you take domestic American issues, uh, this works quite well. Uh, take the minimum wage. The the employer is the oppressor. The, the worker is the oppressed, so we need the minimum wage to help them. Uh, 
uh, the libertarian says the government has no right to interfere in personal freedom between workers and employees, and the conservative sees it as it's important to maintain uh, – I can't even remember the conservative story now. They're going to blank out on it, so we'll leave that out. But my point is that in this particular conflict, the libertarian perspective, although relevant because – in some dimensions because of, say, the way that war often empowers the state in ways that are dangerous to individual freedom. Putting that to the side, that's an internal issue here in Israel. It's an internal issue for sure in, in Gaza. But if we think about the Israeli-Gazan, Israeli-Hamas fight, the progressive conservative lenses look very appropriate here. The Progressive lands, oppressor versus oppressed. Israel is strong. Palestinians and Hamas in particular uh, are powerless. October 7th was an exception, but now they're back as being oppressed. So that – I wouldn't say October 7th is forgotten, but it, it is not uh, – is not usually a perspective that's brought into the current conversation about the war in general from the media. Similarly, the conservatives look at the current war and say, Hamas are barbarians. Look what they did on October 7th. Israel is the at the front lines of the fight for civilization against radical Islam, and therefore Israel is um, the good guy. So the conservatives tend to side with Israel and are sympathetic to Israel, and I would add, tend not to read anything that suggests the Palestinians have a hard time. So the blind spot of the conservative worldview is that, well, sometimes barbarians have something, a moral case to be made. How big it is, what it entitles them to do, that's a different question. But the, the conservative tends to say, look, this is pretty simple. I'm civilized. They're barbarians. We have to do anything it takes to, to, to take care of the problem. The progressive, on the other hand, says Israel is totally powerful. They can do whatever they want, and they, they don't look at any – news stories either that discomfort their worldview, their lens, they tend to focus on stories about, say, Israeli bombing in Gaza and the destruction and the death of civilians, the death of children. October 7th, okay, you know, that was then and maybe justified even, many people, progressives would argue, because what can you blame them? They have nothing, they have no alternative. So again, the agentless, agency less oppressed against the oppressor, in the progressive view, in the conservative view, the fight for civilization against the hordes at the gate, the barbarians. And the, the point I want to emphasize is that, before we go farther, uh, further, is that uh, how biased our consumption of news is, especially in the world of social media, where I can curate my news feed to totally satisfy my worldview and to get outraged at things that violate that worldview. So when I'm on Twitter and I see I'm pro-Israel, I tend to be conservative on this issue, uh, and I see things that make Israel look bad, I read them cringing and I don't want to believe them. Just to take an example, over the last few days, Israel took a bunch of people out in Gaza, stripped them, all men, stripped them down to their underwear. And uh, according to the Israeli defenders of civilization, that was necessary because they sometimes wear suicide belts and suicide vests, and they're dangerous and they're armed. And so therefore, that was a legitimate thing to do. The progressive side has treated this as a war crime. Uh, they write about it on Twitter as if it's a uh, humiliation beyond imagining and that these innocent people cowering in – no, they don't even have bomb shelters in, in Gaza because Hamas didn't build any uh, for whatever – well, we know why they didn't, but they didn't. And so these poor civilians are cowering and now they've been humiliated in front of their wives and children. They've been forced to strip naked and um, this is a horrible thing. And both sides are, are, are outraged. And this is tends to be the nature of coverage. But to step back from that to your world of 2010, say, when you were working for the Associated Press, it, it, you wrote about it as if the only narrative that could be told in the AP newsroom was the progressive narrative. And you give the example of if you propose writing a story on corruption on the part of Hamas – uh, it just couldn't fly. And and if you talked about how they were 
building a military infrastructure. I actually mentioned this tragically. I mean, it's unbearable to read it today. Underneath a civilian infrastructure, um, you can't write about it. So those stories never got written. Is that is that really true? And you can comment on what I said before, too, if you want. I think that your analysis of the way things look generally is is unfortunately very true. People are kind of in silos of information that reinforce what they believe and find the world outside their silo to be increasingly uh, incomprehensible, if not infuriating. And it's very hard to imagine how we'll be able to run democratic societies in uh, in these circumstances. I mean, if you don't even understand, if you don't even agree, you know, who won an election, then it's going to be pretty hard to, um, it's going to be pretty hard to act together for, for the common good. And we're all, I think, in that story, not just where Israel is concerned. It's a much bigger, it's a much bigger phenomenon. And I think that if there, if there's a flaw in those essays that I wrote in 2014, and I'm sure there are many, but I, I was too narrowly focused on Israel. I thought that the press was malfunctioning here and I had seen it intimately and I described what I saw. From 2023, it's very clear that this is part of a much broader malfunction where the press moves from explanatory journalism largely into activism, where the question about any news story is not, is it accurate or not, but does it have the correct political conclusion or not? Will it move our readers in the right direction or not? Does it, you know, does it help the fight for justice or hurt the fight for justice? And those are very different questions than a journalist would traditionally ask. And those are the questions that I saw being being asked. And one example that I gave in the in the first of those two essays, the one I wrote for Tablet, was that at the very end of 2008, reporters in our bureau had information about a fairly dramatic peace offer that had been made by the Israeli Prime Minister at the time, Ehud Olmert, and he had offered the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, who's still the Palestinian President, the Palestinian state, who would have included Gaza, almost all of the West Bank, with a territorial swap or land that Israel was going to annex in the West Bank. And an international arrangement for the old city of Jerusalem is actually quite a dramatic offer. And the Palestinians had deemed it unacceptable. And, and, and that had not been reported at the time. Now everyone knows it, but it had not been reported at the end of 2008, early 2009, when our reporters got wind of it. And, and they were told not to report it. And, um, it seems quite hard to understand why that wouldn't be a major news story for an organization that is preoccupied primarily with covering what was then called the peace process. So here you have an example of what the Israelis are willing to offer and what the Palestinians are or are not willing to accept. It's a very important story. The problem with the story is that it would upset the princess dragon dynamic. It would upset that oppressor oppressed dynamic that we needed to maintain in order to uh, maintain the integrity of our of our story. And, and the story had to be made to go away. And it was, it was. Um, one of the reporters who was involved in it, veteran newsman named Mark Levy came forward after I wrote about this episode. I didn't use any names in those essays. And he came forward and identified himself as one of the reporters and confirmed what I wrote. And there was a lot of anger in the bureau about it because of course that decision makes no journalistic sense, but it makes a lot of political sense if you understand that many journalists have come to see their job as fighting for justice, fighting for the oppressed. So that means that in any given story, you identify who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed. Then you put the resources of your news bureau, which are considerable in terms of you know forming Western opinion, you put those resources at the disposal of the side that is right. And that explains a lot of news coverage that we're seeing, not just from Israel. It explains a lot of news coverage that we saw in the 2016 election. It explains a lot of international coverage that we're seeing. In fact, it's very hard in 2023 to find those corners of the press that have not been contaminated by this kind of thinking, which is one reason that there's so much confusion about what's about what's going on. So, again, being here in Israel and, and being sympathetic to the Israeli story, um, I've been upset, as have been many of my uh, fellow citizens, at how, say, the mainstream press covered uh, the swap of uh, hostages held in Gaza who had been kidnapped at gunpoint to prisoners in Israeli, for prisoners in Israeli jails who had been convicted of trying to murder people in terrorist attacks. And this was treated over and over again as a two equal groups. And I don't mean that they equated them. They used the same terms. Captives were exchanged. I, I can document it. I started to write a piece. I wrote some of it on this. But this happens over and over again. When the ceasefire was broken, 
I hear from the Israeli side that Hamas broke the ceasefire. Hamas claims that Israel broke the ceasefire. All the news coverage was Israel broke the ceasefire, whether, again, I don't know exactly how accurate it was, but it always feels like, I think, to those of us on a side who care deeply about this, that it's our side that's getting the bad, unfair, inaccurate, slanted coverage. And to push back against your story, which, again, I'm very sympathetic to, but to push back against it, you know, I used to know people at National Public Radio pretty well, and they often get accused by pro-Israel supporters of being pro-Palestinian or anti-Israel. They would tell me that, yeah, and guess what? The Palestinians hate our coverage too. They think it's pro-Israel and anti-Palestinian. And I think for journalists, that for them was a redeeming feature, that it felt like they were doing their job. They made both sides angry. And I'm sure the New York Times gets angry mail from Palestinians and angry articles in Twitter and other places that, that the New York Times is slanted toward Israel. Uh, is this a case where it's just hard to see something from someone else's perspective? Or do you really believe that, say, the Associated Press that you had personal experience with, and I'm curious what you think today of those other news outlets, the New York Times, the BBC, Reuters, and others, do you think that they are actively slanting the news? I think that it's definitely possible to write an accurate news story, and you do it by accurately describing the motivations of the different sides. And you can do that. It's it's hard. It's not easy. But you can take Hamas seriously as a political actor and, and describe what they want and accurately describe what the Israelis want. And you can do that in one news story. You know, I'll give you an example of how this worked or, or didn't work. There is a, a boilerplate for people in the news industry is information that you can put in an article without attribution. It's something that is just so evidently true that you can repeat it without attribution. And I personally wrote dozens, maybe hundreds of times that the Palestinian goal is for an independent state alongside Israel in the West Bank and Gaza with its capital in East Jerusalem. That when I was at the AP was boilerplate. And you've probably seen that phrase many times. times. Yeah. It's not true. The, the goal of the Palestinian national movement is and has always been to replace Israel with an Arab state. Now, I'm not saying that's not legitimate. If I were Palestinian, that might be what I would want. So I'm not arguing the legitimacy of that goal. I'm just saying that is the goal. So if you believe that the boilerplate is true, then, then Israel's position makes very little sense. So if you believe that Hamas is out to create an, an independent Palestinian state alongside Israel, it, it's kind of hard to understand what Israel's problem is. But if you are accurately describing what the Palestinians want, then Israel's position also becomes easier to understand. And then you can point to a news story and say, listen, you've accurately described Palestinian aspirations, and we're accurately describing Israeli aspirations, and they're at odds. They can't be reconciled, but here we are. Instead, what reporters will do is they will slant a piece, including writing outright fiction. And I've just given one example of fiction in order to lead you to sympathize with the right side. And the the draw the seduction of doing that is uh, is very real when you're a journalist you want to put the power that you have at the disposal of the people that that you like and i think that there is definitely a way to write knowledgeable accurate news copy you might, you know, might get criticized by all kinds of different people but the reader will get a picture of of what's going on often reporters will come back when they're criticized and say yes but you know i'm I'm getting shit from all from all the sides, right? No, no one's happy with my coverage. That's not really a defense. The question is, is your coverage accurate or not? Can I use your story? Can I take that New York Times story or that AP story and use it as a map with which I can navigate this place and this conflict? And the answer is no. So the coverage isn't good. And that's the critique that I think is is legitimate. I don't think news coverage needs to be friendly to Israel. I think there's a lot to be criticized. I don't think news coverage has to be um, overly critical toward Palestinians. Of course not. I just think it has to describe reality and not fall into the trap of, of playing politics with the coverage. 
there's a reader sitting in St. Louis or sitting in Denver trying to understand very complicated events that are far away. And your job as a journalist is to be knowledgeable and to describe the events as accurately as possible. And you leave politics to others. I think activism is important. I'm glad that there are activists. I think politics is important. I think that you know we need politicians. But as soon as the journalists become activists, as soon as the journalists start playing politics, no one can understand anything that's going on. And that's the situation we're all in right now, unfortunately. So you said it's not true that that the Palestinians want a two-state solution. Um, are you saying that about the average Palestinian, the Palestinian leadership, um, the leadership in the West Bank, the leadership in Gaza? Uh, of course, some people would say similarly, the Israelis don't want a two-state solution. Now, you and I live here. We know many people who did. Uh, that group has gotten smaller over the last two months, but there's still many, many people who hope for a independent Pal in Israel who hope for a Pal independent Palestinian state that lives alongside Israel in peace. They, they may be more pessimistic about the reality of that. They may concede it's a fantasy, at least today, but that's the hope. Do you think there is no, there are no people in, in the West Bank and Gaza who hold a similar view? My experience as a journalist here for almost 30 years is that there are very few and the people who do hold that view have almost no significance to political outcomes. So you have Hamas, which has always been very honest about what they want. And that's one of the things I like about Hamas. They say what they want. They're very open about it. Often Westerners will refuse to hear what they're saying or disguise what they're saying. So, you know, Hamas will say God commands us to eradicate all of the Jews who live in the Islamic world. And the Western observer will say, well, what they really mean is they want an equitable two-state solution that will allow everyone to move forward. That's not what Hamas says. They're very open about what they what they say. In the case of the Palestinian Authority, which is dominated by, by Fatah, which is a, I guess, moderately more moderate, a Palestinian faction, they have paid lip service to the idea of a Palestinian state alongside Israel, but demand that the state of Israel absorb millions of descendants of Palestinian refugees from 1948, meaning that Israel would then become an Arab state after this is um, after this process is, is carried out. And they've never given up that demand. So it's a, that's, it's a complete... That's the right of return, which is a phrase we'll, we'll be talking about probably in the future on the program. And this is the, the idea that the children and grandchildren and some of the people who themselves who lived in what are now the borders of Israel, who lived there in 1948 when Israel became a state, have should have the right to return to their homes and live in Israel on property in property that they uh, either abandoned or were forced from in the 1948 war. They are refugees or the children or grandchildren of refugees. And I I um, will talk, I hope, about this in a future episode, but my understanding is, is that in the education of many Palestinian children, maybe all of them, they're told that this is not only something to aspire to, it will happen. They will return to their homeland uh, that, they, that their grandparents or parents left or that they left in 1948 and will uh, have the rights to live there again as they did then. And as you point out, Israel is a democratic state. It is a ethno-democratic state. It has a Jewish focus. That Jewish focus would be difficult if Jews were a small minority. Right. And all this is just a way to um, uh, explain that, that there is no significant Palestinian constituency for, uh, for the two-state solution. And I think that without even getting into whether the right of return is is right or not. And again, I think if I were on the Palestinian side, I could be sympathetic to it. So I'm not debating the, the legitimacy of the demand. I'm just saying it necessarily means there cannot be a two-state solution. So the two-state solution idea was one that really appealed to Israeli liberals like myself. I would, If that solution were possible, I would sign the deal tonight and I would give up anything that would be necessary in order to achieve a peaceful outcome that would save you know my children and the children of my muslim neighbors from eternal war i would do basically anything if that scenario were possible uh, so it appeals to us 
Israeli liberals. It appeals to many liberal people in the West. It appealed to the Clinton administration, of course, and it has a an ongoing appeal even into the Biden administration. But the, the Palestinians and their hundreds of millions of supporters in the Arab and Islamic worlds, they don't want it. That's not what they want. And I think we can explain what they want uh, and make this conflict much more comprehensible without committing any injustice against the Palestinians. I think, in fact, that miss describing you know their aspirations does them an injustice so I, I think that there is a way to describe events and that is accurate and it will make you know it's not going to make things very satisfying it's not going to make any solution apparent it's not going to lead people to uh you know to be able to solve the puzzle of this of this conflict or of this place but it will make events here easier to understand october 7th is much easier to understand if you understand who the palestinians are and what they want the vast support in palestinian society for the massacre of october 7th that becomes easier to understand if you have an accurate picture of what that society is and what it's been through and and what its aspirations are i think if you came to october 7th on a diet of ap coverage or new york times coverage or bbc coverage you will have no idea why it happened but for israelis although the shock of the, the level of violence was real we lived through years of suicide bombings by Hamas and by other Palestinian factions in the 90s and in the early aughts. We, we have an idea that this strain is very strong in Palestinian society and that the strain that desires peaceful compromise is weak. So we exist in the real world while consumers of Western news coverage exist in a fantasy world that's been created for them by reporters. And you can really see people struggling with that now as they grapple with very complicated and very tragic events in Gaza since October 7th. And we'll get to that in a minute. I want to go back to, to an important issue that you mentioned in 2014, which is depressingly um, timely. And, you know, there have been a number of, you know, there's the ongoing coverage of day-to-day -day aspects of the war, but there have been a few dramatic moments. I just mentioned one a minute ago, the, the pictures of men in their underwear being uh, held at gunpoint. Uh, was was an example, but the beginning of the war, the most important example was the bombing of Al Ali. I don't know how to pronounce it. Hospital, which was immediately attributed to the Israelis. Uh, it, over the next few days afterward, uh, a number of organizations walked it back, said it, maybe it was not Israel, and then finally many said actually it was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad missile. Another group in Gaza, which somehow operates alongside Hamas, which is another myst mysterious thing, I think, for most people. What do you mean? They ha And they have some of the hostages, evidently, too. So Gaza run is run by Hamas, but there's this other group, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and it looks like they shot the missile. It didn't destroy the hospital. It didn't kill 500 people. It ended in a parking lot. It burned a few cars. It maybe killed a couple of people. But, you know, the... Um, there were a number of observers who, you know, who said this is the most horrible morgue and and death scene i've ever seen and of course that wasn't true it was a tragedy of course but it wasn't a tragedy caused by israel it was a tragedy caused by a misfired palestinian Islam islamic shahad rockets that would be one example the second example which is much more important is ongoing and that's the death toll so the palestinian the gazan health ministry is which was, of course, this, the group that broke the hospital story and was clearly lying, uh, is now the source for how many people to tragically have died in Gaza who, who from Israeli, um, the Israeli attack. Uh, I'm sure it's thousands of people. It is a terrible, terrible thing. Israel, you can debate how much effort they've taken to push people away from the, the bombings. You could argue they haven't done enough. You can argue there's no place to go. You can argue that the humanitarian aid isn't getting through to them, those people who are headed south. But Israel has made some effort to uh, save civilian lives. How much is a debatable question. But for some reason, and I find this deeply mysterious and I, it's hard to understand, the death toll from the bombings is um, taken as factual, even though it's issued by the Gazan Health Ministry, which, uh, and they're reported as fact to the single digits. The um, and and the number of women and children that are claimed to be killed in the out of the total is an enormous proportion, and it's treated as a fact. And 
I, I'm, I'm skeptical of that. I'm not skeptical of the tragedy of it. I'm skeptical it's a war. Horrible things happen in war. I'm skeptical of the accuracy of it. And, of course, in 2014, in your piece, you talk about a very similar issue uh, and that I think is happening now, which is how the Hamas counts casualties. So talk about either the hospital and this or both, whatever you feel like. The issue of the Gaza health ministry was one that came up in those years. I was at the AP in 2008, which is the, the first round of serious violence between Israel and Hamas. Israel pulls out of Gaza unilaterally in 2005, and turns it over to the Palestinians. In 2006, the Palestinians have an election in Gaza and the West Bank, and that election is won by Hamas. In 2007, Hamas, in a kind of violent coup, gets rid of the remnants of the Palestinian Authority in Gaza and takes over Gaza. And then the following year, 2008, there's a there's a real war, which involves rockets fired into Israel and everything where we've become used to over the past 15 years. And that was really the first time this script played out. What What is the script? Hamas attacks Israel, draws an Israeli response. Civilians in Gaza are killed. In the Israeli response, the Western press films the civilian casualties under guidance from Hamas and under restrictions from Hamas about what you are and are not allowed to film. That coverage generates outrage in the West, and that outrage forces Israel to cease fire with Hamas left standing. And we've seen that script play out numerous times, so it has happened enough times for Hamas to understand that it works, that, that you can kind of count on international pressure to blunt the Israeli response in time to save Hamas and allow Hamas to, to live to fight another day. And the, the strategy revolves around civilian casualties and having them covered by the Western press. So the, the Western press has a role to play in, in the Hamas script and the central organ of the script, I would say, is the Gaza Health Ministry. What is the Gaza Health Ministry? It's an office of Hamas that puts out the casualty numbers. And the casualty numbers, beginning in 2008, are the center of the story in a way that's quite unique. You don't really see it in the same way in the Russia-Ukraine story or in other war stories. You'll see the, the death toll as really the center the central point of the story almost. So you'll see the events of a given day described, maybe some historical background background to the war. And then you'll see a number of Israeli casualties and a number of Palestinian casualties, and those numbers will be greatly disparate. And there are complicated reasons for that, of course, but it gives the reader a clear signal about who is right in the war, because the numbers are, you know, are, are going to be very, very different. And um, the Gaza Health Ministry is the source of, of, of the numbers. And for a long time, the press was just attributing numbers to the, to the Gaza Health Ministry as if it were a reliable source. And sometimes when I was at the AP, those numbers would actually be attributed to the UN. They would, they would say it's a UN number. And the UN was just getting it from the Gaza Health Ministry, meaning that Hamas was feeding these, these numbers to the press and it was really guiding the story. And then what happens after the end of each round of violence is that Hamas eventually releases its own casualty numbers because the, the casualty numbers you're getting are only civilians. So what Hamas is trying to do is create a, a picture of only civilian death in Gaza. So Israel is fighting Hamas, and yet somehow only civilians are dying, and most of them are women and children, as you as you mentioned, and that's really visible in, in the numbers. The army, the Israeli army says that the number of Hamas fatalities is around 5,000. I don't think they really know, but those are nowhere in the Gaza Health Ministry statistics. And there's an incident that I relate in, in the story that I wrote for The Atlantic in 2014 from a cameraman who a Western cameraman who was in Gaza who said we used to stand outside Chief Hospital, that's the main hospital in Gaza City. When civilian casualties came in, we would film them. When Hamas casualties came in, when military casualties came in, there was a Hamas minder at the door to the hospital and he would signal to us with his hand and we'd turn off our cameras. And that gives you the impression that only civilians are being killed. Or you'll see the aftermath of an Israeli airstrike, but you'll never see the rocket fire that precipitated the airstrike because you're not allowed to film that. So Hamas has become quite adept at creating this picture of Israeli aggression and civilian casualties, and it's doing so because it's proven to be effective in generating international pressure that ultimately forces Israel to stop. And by the way, I'm not sure they're wrong. I'm not, I'm not sure they're wrong. I mean, it might happen this time too. Pressure is increasing on Israel as time goes by, as the press uses the, the Hamas numbers to uh, to ratchet up international pressure. It might happen that, you know, eventually 
the U.S. administration will pull the plug on the Israeli military campaign and Hamas will still be in charge in Gaza. It's not it's not impossible. And I'll just say one one more thing. So I'm not misconstrued, as you said. Of course, there is a civilian tragedy in Gaza. Many, many thousands of innocent people are dead in Gaza. And I wouldn't want to be seen in any way as minimizing that or ignoring it. It's it's true and it's horrific. And it's the result of a war that Hamas started on October 7th. And it's a result of the battlefield that Hamas has constructed. Right? They've constructed a military landscape that is indistinguishable from the civilian landscape. Hamas fighters wear civilian clothes. Uh, Hamas tunnels are under civilian neighborhoods. Hamas headquarters are located under hospitals in some cases. And Hamas stores weapons under UN facilities and schools. So we're talking about a battlefield that Hamas has created, which necessarily leads to civilian casualties. And as I said, that's part of the way Hamas wages war. And yet much of this is invisible in news coverage. So you get this impression of, of Israeli aggression that targets civilians. And to give Hamas its due, which is not easy for me, but I'm going to make do my best here. Um, you know, their slogan, and it's a slogan that has been displayed on the streets of London. Uh, I'm sure New York, I haven't literally seen it, but I've seen it in London in the photos by any means necessary. And um, that justifies October 7th. It justifies putting your headquarters under a hospital. It justifies kidnapping women and children. And uh, it justifies lying about casualties because hey, they don't have an Air Force. Their Air Force are a bunch of paragliders. Their Navy is a pitiful set of, of rubber boats. Um, they're living in an open-air prison, according to the narrative of Gaza that has been blockaded from, by Israel from since 2008 and the rise of Hamas. And what they are trying to do is to be free. Uh, the only thing I would add that I think is important to add is the point you made sort of in passing, which is... Um, they're not fighting for peace. They're not fighting for a two-state solution. They're fighting to eradicate the Jewish state, and often the Jews who live here. Uh, they've <laughs> again, it's not subtle. You know, they had a, a sp spokespeople day after days after October seventh saying, "We we need to do this over and over again. We need to do it a million times uh, if we can." Um, so that's what we're the war we're in now. I. I'm just in passing, I'm just curious, you know, again, I, listeners don't know you. I know you a little bit. You you are one of the most prominent um, critics of the Netanyahu administration. You were a, a very prominent critic of the judicial reform. You certainly don't believe Israel should be immune from criticism. You, you're, you were a, um, I'll just put in a plug for your book Pumpkin Flowers, which is about your personal experience in the Lebanese war, which is one of the best books on war I've ever read. Uh, it's short and powerful, and, a, and it's really a masterpiece. So I encourage uh, listeners to read it, Pumpkin Flowers, one word. Uh, so you're not um, an extremist on the right. You have, I think, have been an advocate for a two-state solution, or at least hoping for one. Um, and, and I'm curious if you have any qualms about this war. So let, let me let me phrase it differently. I've heard many people, civilized people, and one of the challenges of being a civilized person fighting barbarians is that it tends to turn you into a barbarian. Uh, you know, many people have compared this war to World War II, the fight against the Nazis or the fight against Imperial Japan. Well, the allies in World War II were there was nothing out of bounds. Uh, you know, the Allies leveled cities, they carpet bombed, uh, they dropped an atomic bomb on two Japanese cities. Uh, there, there was no, and they did it without guilt, by the way. They acted as barbarians in the name of civilization, and they killed many, many innocent people who weren't remotely supportive of the Japanese imperial effort or the, the Nazis. Uh, the Nazis had some democratic pretense. They were not even elected by a majority. Neither was Hamas. Uh, you know, I, I do not like the Israeli viewpoint. This is, well, they voted for Hamas, so this is payback. This is what you get. That does not follow ethically for me at all. And yet, if you live here in Israel, you do feel often that we have a right to be here. We have plenty to apologize for, but we have a right to be here. And so 
does that limit what we do in Gaza at all? D- does it mean we can kill as many civilians as is necessary to root out Hamas? Again, we could debate historians maybe will in the future as to how much care Israel took in avoiding uh, civilian casualties. And I would say that Israel's done a very bad job uh, of making this case. Uh, they've published a lot of pictures of rubble and failed to point out, which I th- what I think is correct, is that a lot of that rubble was created without people in it. So it's true that Israel has destroyed a good chunk of northern Gaza, but it hasn't killed the people in northern Gaza. They've killed some, and that's horrible, but we don't know how many. And of the counts that are given, we don't know how many of those are actually Hamas fighters versus truly innocent civilians. So do you have thoughts on that? Do you think do you think there's any moral calculus that Israel should be held to in this in this point in the fight? Of course I do. And Israel's army, and I know this from, from the inside, it's not an army that never makes mistakes, but it's an army that has no interest in killing civilians. I mean, even if we put the moral questions aside, and I think the moral questions are very much alive for the people, you know, in the control rooms who are carrying out the targeted airstrikes. But if even if we set those considerations aside, civilian casualties work against Israeli interests because they increase outrage that then limits our freedom of action. So, you know, I think that there are certainly moral considerations here. The, the laws of war are important. You can't just bomb civilians for no reason. You can't, you know, carpet bomb Dresden in 2023. But you're facing an organization that is indistinguishable from the civilian landscape in which it operates. So when Israel is attacked by Hamas, Israel has two options. It can either fight Hamas or not fight Hamas. And if you choose to fight Hamas, as of course we must, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. This is a group that has, according to various reports, I've seen 500 kilometers of tunnels underneath the civilian landscape of Gaza. So how are you supposed to kill the Hamas guys in those tunnels? And we've all seen the the tunnels under Shifa Hospital, and we've seen Hamas fighters wearing civilian clothes operating, you know, in civilian areas and and if you are going to fight them and they're forcing you to fight them then this is what it looks like and it's it's awful and you know the the pictures coming out of Gaza are incredibly difficult to watch and many of those people are innocent and you know even if a majority of Palestinians did vote for Hamas in 2006 and even if you know you're a 12 year old whose parents voted for Hamas that doesn't mean that your life is is forfeit in, in any way and these are my neighbors I mean this is all going on about an hour and a half from where I'm sitting uh, and an hour and a half from where you two are sitting, Russ. So, so uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's no joy in any of this. It's it's absolutely horrific. But this is the battlefield that Hamas has built, and and Israel spent 15 years trying not to do what it is doing now. But we've had repeated rounds of violence in Gaza, and Israel has always hoped that each round was the last round, and it has hoped that if we just put enough technological defense in place, we'll be able to leave Hamas and Gaza and go about our lives. So we have this missile system called Iron Dome, which has shot down thousands of rockets coming in from Gaza. And we have, you know, we have this high-tech fence that was supposed to protect the communities in southern Israel. And we have this whole defense array, which was aimed in many ways, I think, at preventing what we're now seeing, preventing an all-out war where the Israeli army has to go into Gaza and um, and eradicate Hamas tunnel by tunnel. And, and the price for Israelis is, is, is very high. I mean, a lot, you're going to see a lot more coverage of the casualties in Gaza, which are, of course, much higher numerically than casualties in Israel, but we're losing two or three soldiers a day. I just heard that two soldiers from my own reserve brigade were killed, a guy who's 36 and a guy who's 42. And this is just every day in Israel now. So if Israel truly wanted to eradicate the threat of Hamas and did not care about civilians, Israel could do that in one day. There's a way to eradicate Hamas in Gaza, and you could do it in in 24 hours. And the fact that Israel isn't doing that, I think, shows that they're looking for a way, the army's looking for a way to eradicate a threat that for us is unbearable. We can't allow something like October 7th to happen again. They're trying to eradicate that threat while doing what we can do to kill as few civilians as possible. And, and, you know, I think there will be a debate after the war about whether 
each decision was was the right one. But uh, from what I know from inside the army, from what I know about the legal advisors who sign off on airstrikes, and from what I know about the amount of effort that was put into finding humanitarian safe zones, the element of surprise that was sacrificed in many cases by warning civilians that the army is about to come in. From what I know, I uh, you know I'm, I can say simultaneously that the the images are horrific and and unbearable, and I think that. As Israelis, our, our conscience can be clear. Some people have suggested, not many. Uh, and, well, let me just start. Let me cover the whole range of of opinion here, and in, in a in a crude thumbnail. Uh, you and I don't want to kill civilians. There might be some Israelis who want Gaza to be resettled as Israeli. Um, Settlements. Uh, there were settlements there in 2005 when Israel withdrew there from there. There were um, Israeli settlements. They were unable. The Israeli army was tired of trying to protect them and taking casualties in, from terrorists. And in 2005, Israel vacated Gaza, as you said, vacated those settlements by force because the people who lived there did not want to leave. Um and left behind an infrastructure of everything that had been built there in hopes of uh, a, a better world. But there are people in our communities who don't want that. They have no sympathy for the Palestinians. They have no sympathy for Gaza. They don't, not, not only they have no sympathy for Hamas, they have no sympathy for the 12 year old whose parents didn't vote for Hamas in 2005. I, I think there are such people, but my experience is that they are few and far between on the, what is, would be called the extremist right here. At the extremist left here, which has gotten much smaller since October 7th, um, there are people who've told me they think we should have done nothing. In response to October 7th, because of this brutality that, that we're inflicting on innocent civilians, uh, because of the deaths of uh, Israeli soldiers, because of the trauma of war that is not measured in death counts, but is real, that is absorbed by both uh, the residents of Gaza and the Israeli army of 36-year-olds, but also 20-year-olds. We should have done nothing. We should have improved our intelligence, improved our surveillance, improved our border, created a buffer zone of a kilometer or two, so we'd have had more time to react if there was a border incursion. Uh, you, in passing, had a little phrase, I don't remember how you worded it, that we didn't have a choice. These people say we did have a choice, and we do have a choice. We could still, and even now, we could stop. We could try to get the remaining hostages out through negotiation. Why do you think we had to respond? And I, one more thing. They would also add that by responding, we're just continuing this cycle that we've seen before. We'll create more Israel hatred in and Jew hatred in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank and elsewhere. And not only will we not achieve our goals, we will make them even less successful than before we started. There's always a seduction in surrender. And I think we remember Chamberlain and how he was applauded when he came back with, with his great piece of paper and waved it around. And there's always that idea that if we just do nothing, it will, it will go away. And um, of course, that's, that's completely incorrect. If, if you do nothing, then this will happen again. And as you pointed out, the leaders of Hamas have openly said since October 7th that they'll do it again as soon as they have a chance. So, of course, Israel has no choice. This is not a threat that we can live with. And if Hamas is left in power in Gaza, not only can more than 100,000 Israelis never return to their homes near the border, but in the long term, the state of Israel will not be able to exist. If you accept an attack like this on your people, then you have no legitimacy legitimacy as a state, you're not providing your citizens with with protection and our lives are are forfeit and at the mercy of religious fanatics who are very open about their about their intentions. So sometimes you're forced to fight and it's awful. And they of course of course I understand those who would rather stick their head in the sand and you know and, and hope that it'll never happen again if we just uh, if we just ignore it but that's not true and I'm very proud of this society actually for rallying in, in the way that it has this is a society with very disparate views people don't agree on a lot of stuff and as you mentioned I've been very critical of this government and I'm more you know on the left politically and have very little in common with some of the people who are 
in, in, in the current government. But um, I'm very proud of the volunteerism of Israeli society. When the war broke out, more people showed up for reserve duty than, than the army had weapons for. So so many people reported to serve that the army didn't have guns for, for everyone. And there's been this incredible outpouring of volunteerism and housing the evacuees. We have people evacuated from the communities in the south and from the communities on the northern border, which we often forget, but almost everyone along the northern border was evacuated because we're worried that Hezbollah can do what Hamas just did in Gaza. Uh, there's this volunteerism to replace the, the workers who did much of the agricultural labor in Israel's south. Many of the laborers were Thai, and some of those laborers were murdered by Hamas. Others were, were kidnapped by Hamas, and the rest of them, quite understandably, ran away so no one is around to pick the crops. And thousands of Israelis are down in the south every day picking crops. I was just down there yesterday, as a matter of fact, doing that myself. And there is an incredible kind of solidarity and incredible clarity of purpose right now in Israel that I'm very proud of. So those voices do exist. Uh, I think that position is ludicrous. And there are also positions on the far right that you mentioned, which I find abhorrent. You know, the position that says there are no innocent civilians in Gaza or the idea that we need to reinsert Israeli settlers into Gaza. These are, you know, not tenable positions in my in my opinion, but the core of Israeli society understands that we've just seen something horrific. We've just seen really a barbarism on a medieval scale. And the answer is unfortunately war against the people who committed this act and say they'll do it again. And that's what we're doing. It's incredibly painful for people I'm going at four o'clock to make a condolence call uh, to a family that just lost their son. And I've had to take my 16-year-old sons to two funerals at the National Military Cemetery in Jerusalem. And uh, we know a young man who's a hostage in Gaza who's badly wounded at that famous, that infamous party in the South and, and is now a hostage in Gaza. And my children know another young Israeli who was killed at the same party. So, you know, we're all kind of caught up in this absolutely horrific event, but we're responding in a way that I think is admirable and, and um going to require a lot of tenacity from us in the next couple months as it as it continues. But I don't, I certainly don't think that uh, covering our eyes and pretending that we can make it go away is the right thing to do. Uh, in our earlier, before I, I'm going to take a <clears throat> change tack a little bit in a minute. But I, before we do, I want to make clear when we talked earlier about the casualties and the fact that Hamas uh, includes uh, counts all casualties, civilian casualties, whether they're Hamas fighters or not. Uh, you actually documented in your story that the person, maybe it was you, who wanted to report that was told you can't. It was censored because Hamas didn't want that revealed. Is that accurate? In late 2008, I was an editor on the AP desk in Jerusalem, and I was in charge of writing the news stories from Jerusalem using news material that was coming in from Gaza. So this is during that first round of violence between Israel and Hamas. At the time, we had an excellent reporter in Gaza, a Palestinian reporter. By the way, the, the heavy lifting of the news industry in Gaza is done by Palestinians from Gaza. I think that's important to understand. Today, it's done almost exclusively by Palestinians from Gaza, meaning that the people reporting for Western news outlets are people who live under Hamas rule and cannot cross Hamas because it might cost them their life. And I think that's something that people don't necessarily get, but which is, of course, is very important to know. But this was 15 years ago, and we didn't quite understand that yet. So in the morning, the reporter told us that Hamas fighters were dressed in civilian clothes and were being counted as civilians in the death toll, which is, of course, a crucial fact if we're using the death toll as the central fact of, of the story. And then called back a few hours later and, and told me I had to remove that detail from the story. And it was clear that he'd been spoken to, that he'd crossed some line that had been established by the new Hamas authorities in Gaza. And of course, I removed the detail from the story and I wasn't going to endanger a reporter for any, for any reason. And I suggested to the person running the news desk that we append an editor's note at the bottom of the story that informed our readers that we were now conforming with Hamas censorship, that we couldn't tell them the whole story because, you know, our reporters were being... Um, censored by by Hamas, and I, I was overruled. It, it's worth knowing that whenever the Israeli military censor touches a story, we would note that the story had been looked at by a censor, even if the censor didn't make any changes. Often stories that relate to Israel's nuclear program have to go through the censor, and um, we would note 
in a story whenever that happened. And yet since that story that I was mentioning from the end of 2008, AP never made clear that they were conforming with Hamas censorship. And that's true of all of the big Western news organizations that have permanent operations in Gaza. They've all made accommodations with Hamas. They're all reporting and not reporting certain things. And they're not telling you what those things are. And I think that is maybe, you know, the, the greatest ethical feeling of the press in Gaza among many. So you mentioned that you've gone with your children to funerals. Of course, I've been to funerals as well. Um, I live in Jerusalem. I mentioned, I think, uh, in Tel Aviv, a previous episode or one that's coming. I don't remember which it is. Um, the existence of the hostages who are kidnapped is everywhere. Uh, you can't get away from it. It's a very heavy uh time here in Israel, uh, and I'm sure it's very heavy in Gaza too, but it's certainly very heavy here. There is no joy. Uh, there's a lot of sadness, and of course we worry it's going to get worse. Um, I'm curious for you, especially you as a critic of the government that's still in power um, and still doing many, many things that I'm sure you and I disagree with uh, outside of Gaza. <laughs> Um, how has this changed you in your view of, of what it's like to live here, of your resolve to live here, your political outlook, your hopes for the future? Talk about that. The only positive thing we can say about the current government is that the, the makeup of the government was diluted somewhat by the addition of a centrist party. Benny Gantz's party that joined the government when the war started. So at least I feel that now we have a few more responsible adults in the in the room where the big decisions are are being made. But I'm certainly hoping for an election as soon as possible. And I'm hoping for new Israeli leadership that is reasonable and rational and um, has no representation of the extreme right. And I hope we see that as, as soon as possible. This, I think, you know, in terms of what, what has changed, I think that like like most Israelis, I was happy. I was happy that we were playing defense on the Gaza border. I didn't want to see a major war in Gaza. I didn't think we had anything to gain by one. You know, I thought we could put up with these periodic rocket barrages and just, you know, ignore them and and you know, go just ignore them and go back to uh, you know doing what Israelis do, which is business and art and living like crazy. And, and I thought that that was the right attitude. I didn't want to get drawn into this kind of black Middle Eastern hole by the forces of, of chaos and fundamentalism. And, and, and I think that was wrong. And I think that if you ignore a threat like this, eventually it will blow up in your face. And Hamas was you know, firing rocket barrages at us from 2008, and in part because we had the tech to blunt those attacks because we had Iron Dome, we could lie to ourselves and tell us that this wasn't really happening. And if your neighbor is firing thousands of rockets at you, he's trying to tell you something and you need to take care of it immediately and not wait 10 years for him to build up a massive military force, break through the fence and murder a thousand civilians and, you know, murder babies and rape women and kidnap people and murder, you know, almost 400 people at a, at a music festival. And in retrospect, we were, we were, wrong to ignore the threat and had Israel taken an aggressive military posture after 2008, I think we could have avoided what is ultimately a higher number of casualties, both military casualties and civilian casualties in Gaza. I think we needed to act um, quickly and aggressively as soon as the nature of the threat became clear. And I think that's something that we've that we've now learned and it's going it, that has repercussions for what we're going to see. Um, in the future, I don't think this war will necessarily end in the way that previous wars ended. There might not be a ceasefire. The idea that you just stop fighting and let your enemy rearm, I'm not sure that that is possible or or wise. So, you know, like most Israelis, and I think like many people abroad who've been, who've had their eyes open and saw what happened on October 7th, we saw something horrific. I mean, we saw an evil that was not supposed to exist in the world of the 21st century, an evil that we prefer to ignore but you can't ignore it because they filmed it with GoPros and put it online. So the risks are clear. What's at stake is clear. And, um, and I don't think we can allow ourselves to be fooled again. Do you have any optimism for the day after? 
because the, you know, some people say, well, eradicate Hamas. Hamas is an idea. Can't eradicate an idea. No, but you can stop the people who are the violent uh, proponents of that idea from running an area. I think that's potentially will happen. Um, I think we will kill and uh, will kill many of the perpetrators of this um, the massacre of October seventh, including the 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 people behind it, the brains behind it. But what's the hope for Gaza two point oh? What could possibly come along? You know, an, an unexpected source of hope over the past two months has been Germany. And I'm not sure if you caught the speech by the vice chancellor of, of I did. Germany, <laughs> which was maybe the most remarkable speech to come out of this entire period, including speeches from Israeli leaders, which have been you know, largely lackluster and lacking in any vision. And if, if you find that speech and you can find it online, you'll see an incredible enunciation of not just support for Israel, but but Western values and what they mean, and the commitment of the German state to the survival of the Jewish people and to the survival of the state of Israel. And if we rewind 80 years ago, it's impossible to believe it's Germany. And you know that if that's possible, then a lot of things are possible. And they've also frozen their funding of um, the UN refugee organization, UNRWA. They have, and they've let a Hanukkah menorah at the Brandenburg Gate, the largest menorah in Egypt, with their their prime minister it's a shocking change of it does it gives me hope not just because it's germany but because they've changed you know the, it's not that there is a nation that feels that way it's that it's the nation that was so hostile to the jews has become uh so supportive is comforting not again just because it's pleasant but because it suggests that change is possible right and nazism was an idea and it was a very powerful idea that had a lot of support in germany and it was vanquished and and I'm, I think we all need to be careful with historical parallels. It's not going to work the same way. The situation is not is not the same. But change change is possible, and there are points of light elsewhere in the Middle East, and we saw them unfold in the past couple of years with these new accommodations, which we call the Abraham Accords. You know, there are places in the Middle East which they're not democratic, but they're forward looking. They're able to provide something for their citizens. Gaza has a great location. You know, it's got a sits on the Mediterranean coast. It could potentially be a hub for material moving from Egypt, from Israel, from elsewhere in the Middle East. Under the right governance, there's a lot of potential for Gaza. And I think the, that many Israelis were hoping that that would be the scenario that unfolded after the disengagement from Gaza in 2005. I know that I, I certainly was. I'd love to see Gaza look like Singapore or like Dubai and, you know, that seems very distant, unfortunately, from 2023, but it's certainly not its certainly not impossible. Ultimately, what happens in Gaza and what happens in the West Bank and what happens with the Palestinians is up to the Palestinians. And I think that often Israel is asked you know, what the solution is or what the path forward is. Israel's not going to be able to decide for the Palestinians what the path forward is. You know, if the Palestinians come across our border and murder 1,200 people, then we're going to be forced to respond. But the future of Gaza is up to the people in Gaza. And if they choose Hamas as the future, then this is what it looks like. You can turn on your TV and see what that future looks like. And if they want to have a different future, and I hope that they will, I think that there's a lot of potential. I hope it doesn't take you know, 80 years, as in the case of Germany. But um, but I think that there, are, I think that history is flexible. And I think that the fact that we've seen one thing up until now doesn't mean that that is necessarily the thing that we'll see going forward. And at my most positive moments, I see this war as a, as a turning point, right? The forces of darkness <laughs> made themselves apparent in the most horrific way possible. And an Israeli victory here might turn the, turn the direction, not just in Gaza, but in the Middle East as a whole, away from the forces of Hamas and Hezbollah and the Iranian proxies that seek to drag us all into a vortex of violence, but more in the direction of, of the UAE or of other states in the Gulf that have identified a, a different kind of future. We'll see, you know, there are only 6 million Israeli Jews, there are only 9 million Israelis, the Arab world is 300 million people, the Islamic world is 1.5 billion people, maybe 2 billion people. So the effect that the Jewish state of Israel is going to be able to have on the ultimate outcome in the Middle East is 
is very limited. If you think that Israel is the most important story in the world, which is how it's covered, of course, then you think that you know Israeli actions are are very significant and that Israel can you know, bring peace to the Middle East or not bring peace to the Middle East. We're tiny, tiny people in one corner of the region, and the ultimate outcome in in this part of the world, unfortunately, is not up to us. My guest today has been Mati Friedman. Mati, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks again, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.